Hi, what's going on? <laughs> uh, this is Andy, and this is another My Zen Brain Book Report. Uh, it's been a while since I put any time or energy or any thought really into My Zen Brain. Uh, I went on a very therapeutic vacation. In July, I went to Kearney and hung out with my friend Kevin, who I know from the days when I was at the Reader. And then I camped a couple times, and I went, well, first, before I even went anywhere, I went to uh, Cabela's. And, uh, yeah, the, uh, the high-end specialty outdoor gear industry has changed quite a bit since I last checked on it, <laughs> at least the one in Omaha. Um, but I got a tent and I got a stove and I got a pot and pan. And, um, I camped uh, at Bessie Campground, which was a lovely little time. I, I went for like a five-hour hike uh, and I pinched my tent and I uh, just laid my tent and I had a, it's uh, a mesh uh, top, so I just stared at the trees and it was glorious and then as i drifted off to sleep that night uh the train the i can only assume it was the union pacific train uh came roaring down the tracks that were about mm, 100 yards from the campsite uh and that pretty much continued f about every 45 minutes or so and at least until i kind of drifted off to sleep uh, went out to Valentine, Nebraska. Went to the uh, went to some wildlife preserves out there. Uh, bent down to North Platte, and I saw my friend Jeff, who I haven't seen since we lived together in Chicago when I was twenty two years old. So that was great, uh, and seeing him and his wife uh, was just I I was so I was so excited. I was I was I was talking just. I mean, talking her ear off and talking Jeff's ear off, and Jeff, Jeff's a talker anyway. But uh, um, yeah, so I, anyway, so we had a great time together, and uh, we had a, uh, some burgers, and <clears throat> just uh, it was great. So I, I came back, and I realized the more that I thought about it, that if I'm going to put uh, any productivity into my Zen brain, I'm gonna have to really uh, reconsider when I'm, when I'm doing my Zen brain work. And in the morning before I work, I like to meditate and have coffee, and then go to the gym. And I read sometimes if I have if I can, and I nap sometimes if I can. So I really have not had much of a place for my Zen brain um, since I started, really. So I decided, okay, well, uh, we'll we'll, th we'll we'll rethink this the way the same way we're rethinking a lot of other things in my life. I did quit smoking finally again. No, it's only two weeks ago, but I'm pretty sure this time is going to stick. And I definitely cleaned up my diet a little bit. So all the stuff that I said before in the months uh, in the spring <clears throat> are coming to fruition. And uh, I'm pretty excited about it, and I'm, uh, oh, uh, and I wanted to just add that, uh, and I, I need to uh, make, I, I, th I think I need to put this uh, on my Facebook profile, I don't know, uh, but if you uh, watch one of the, one of my videos, or listen to my one of my podcasts, or uh, <laughs> Pie in the Sky, read a blog post, uh, considering I haven't blogged in probably six months, but who knows, Stranger things have happened. Um, you can get a hold of me and tell me that you liked it or you hated it and you want me to uh, uh, go uh, jump in a lake or whatever. Uh, you can get a hold of me at myzenbrain uh, at gmail.com. Myzenbrain at gmail.com. Uh, and so let's get down to it. So today I finally was able to take notes and write the book report for the book that essentially gave me permission to be a Buddhist. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was about two, maybe about a year, maybe into, uh, me exploring the Buddhist path and the Buddhist journey. And, 
I, as I, I think I've mentioned before, I have this thing where uh, once I, once I grab a topic or a subject, I tend to just go with it and I tend to uh, uh, learn as much about it as, as I possibly can, <clears throat> or at least as much of, as, of, as, of it as is necessary, like uh, learning how to use the Roadcaster 9000, for example. Uh, but anyway, uh, I found this book. It was by, I kid you not, uh, the name of the author is Dinty W. Moore. Dinty Moore. Try not to, th try not to think of, about uh, beef stew. I dare you. I double dog dare you. Uh, but he, uh, you can go to his Wikipedia page. He has a really interesting bio. Um, and he wrote this book. Um, let's see. Nineteen ninety-seven was the copyright date, so it's been around a long time. Um, and I came to this book uh, by accident, really. The first book I gave a book report on, *The Zen of Recovery*, was I was admonished to read by another person in recovery, and, and back in those halcyon days of early recovery, and I was still writing *The Pink Cloud*. The Pink Cloud. Is a uh, staying as a saying in the program that refers to that state so often alluded to by folks not new to sobriety to refer to that semi euphoria of the newcomer who doesn't yet realize that after the endorphins and the pheromones and the serotonin like bliss that comes from not dumping a couple liters of a depressant into your digestive system every day wears off they will again be faced with the mundanity of life. <clears throat> and I, I think I looked that up, mundanity. I'm not even sure it's a word, but it should be a word. And after reality wrenches you off the pink cloud and you go back to work at the Home Depot and you are faced with how to fill these hours of sobriety that you suddenly have, the hours that you used to waste on boozing. Anyway, I came to the accidental Buddhist, um, let's see, oh, wait a minute, um, I, there we go, uh, I may have mentioned that my habit of, of obsession wherein I find a new hobby or subject or activity that I really like engaging with, I engage with it all the time, uh, I think I found Accidental and Buddhist a few books after I had taken to researching Buddhism and I couldn't resist when I saw it at the library and that it was written by Dinty Moore. At first I thought it was some sort of spoof work like The Big Lebowski in Philosophy or America the Book with Jon Stewart, but was in some manner a book with the odd through line of beef stew in it maybe. But no, the book was actually written by Dinty Moore, and Dinty Moore and I share a staunchly Catholic upbringing, complete with several of the sacraments, uh, a youth complete with weekly and often bi-weekly attendance at Mass, and a Catholic high school where every single atten attendee came factory installed with an XY genotype, Moore wrote in the introduction a sentence that derived from a thought that had been bouncing around in my head ever since I was old enough to take my critical ski thinking skills out for a test drive. Quote, I began to suspect when that when the old priests and the nuns who had been guiding me three, I'm sorry, let's try it again. I began to suspect that when the old priests and nuns who had been guiding me through my childhood and early adolescence said, you must take the truth of Jesus on faith, what they were really saying was, we have absolutely no idea of any of this, so you're pretty much on your own. He then goes on to explain some of the nuts and bolts of Buddhist terms and Buddhist traditions, and he does so with exactly what the reader knew to Buddhism and not necessarily sure it's something that will work for them craves, is which is a healthy mix of skepticism, cynicism, and curiosity. He explains the concept of monkey mind, the condition born of our chronically active culture, as he calls it, that leads so many people to take up meditation in the first place, which is to tame the beast, to stop all the chatter in our minds, 
to apply a non-chemical sedative <clears throat> to the hungry, anxious ball of worries and sorrows and joys and that each of us carry around on our shoulders every day. After learning a good chunk about Buddhism and, and, and meditation, more echoes what many a reader will find themselves thinking, which is that Buddhism can't be as simple as just sitting and meditating. It simply can't. There has to be more to it than that. As one of Moore's early Zen teachers admonishes him, it really is that simple. Quit worrying so much and just do it. Just sit. Now I see. The difficulty I have with Buddhism is that it's too damn simple. Unquote. A list on my refrigerator. This is Andy again. <laughs> de details 10 Zen things we should do or one should do to lead a healthy, healthier, more fulfilled, content life. And I don't know who came up with them, but it states in stark terms few things that are invaluable. The first four, and I think the most important, are number one, do one thing at a time. Number two, do it slowly and deliberately. Three, do it completely. Four, and do less. <laughs> and I don't know where the list comes from, but I do know that I have been a practicing Zen Buddhist for eight years, and I st still struggle with those first four, and especially that fourth. Nor talks about how Zen really is about not concentrating on the external things like jobs and family and money, which we think we want, but in an actuality, simply create more static for us in our lives. He states that the thinking that family, job, money, possessions, new car, whatever, will make us happy and it's what binds us and causes our discontent. In other words, as he says, I'm quoting again, it is okay to have a suburban home, an air-conditioned Lexus, a comfortable income. It's even okay to deliberately arrange our lives in such a way that these things become possible. But only so long as we don't expect these things to make us happy. Happiness is internal, not external. And chasing externals is a waste of time. Unquote. Moore compares what he knows about Jesus and Christianity, which is quite a bit, he was raised Catholic, to what he is learning about Buddhism, and he shares some of the people and places that taught him, and one exchange in particular caught my attention because it was Moore's interaction with another Christian, but not Christian the way Catholics are Christian, but the seriously Christian type, like the Southern Baptist Christian type, the the born again type. He says, quote, I have a big difference, he says to the man who was by trade, and I'm not making this up, a carpenter. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Let, let's start that again. He's talking to this man, and the man says, there's a big difference between Christianity and Buddhism. He says to the man, was by trade, and I'm not making this up, a carpenter. Not really, the carpenter replies. There are lots of parallels. He follows it up with a sentiment I absolutely love that this carpenter says, and the Buddhist scholar Thich Nhat Hanh has repeated, and that is that Jesus was a Buddha. And to fully understand that phrase, there is another equally mystifying phrase that you'll start to understand the more you meditate and learn about Buddhism, the more you realize that the world doesn't need more Buddhists the world needs more Buddhas. I take this to mean the world needs more people who actually think about what they think and aren't afraid to strip away the beliefs and the convictions that ultimately cause them suffering. Like, say, worrying about the souls of people who believe different truths about the nature of the universe than them. Or, as the Dalai Lama once said, we shouldn't worry because the things we worry about that we can do something about, we should just do that something. And the things that we worry about that we can't do anything about, well, we can't do anything about them, so we shouldn't worry about them. Moore closes out that first part of, the, of his book with a line that I've come to love since my 16 years of Catholic education will did a number on me. He says, 
as a Catholic, I was, it was pounded into my brain day after day that I belong to the, quote, one true faith. Buddhists, on the other hand, tend to say, well, here's a way. It's not the way, but it's a pretty good one. See if it works for you. And then more writes something that hits me where I live. I think precisely because what my sickness, because, let's start that again, and then more writes something that hits me where I live. I think precisely because what my sickness and recovery, recovery from it, which in many ways is still ongoing and probably always will be, but what my sickness exemplified for me was that, quote, once we realize that we are empty, that when we call ourself, that we, what we call ourself is really just a bag of meat supported by, supported by calcium sticks, and that all energy is all energy, <clears throat> a continuum of energy, and there is no independent I, quote unquote, kindness and compassion can only follow. In the eight years after I got sick, I pushed the limits of what a body can and should be asked to do. I drank decent beer in the early days of my alcoholism, and I drank shots of chill, chill Dagermeister from the from the freezer. That was my that was my potion. Of course, as the years wore on, and I stopped caring about everything and everybody, most importantly myself and I stopped having dreams or goals and beyond my obligation to my dog because, damn it, he waited for me to come back and really was the only good thing I had in my life, except for my family, of course. But ultimately, I estranged myself from them, too. And anyway, I ate crap food and I drank all the time and the only exercise I got most of the time was walking the K-Man. And it wasn't until I was about 10 days sober when I had that aha moment, as we say in the program, and I wondered how in the hell I had let my health and my life get so magnificently jacked up. So anyway, more riffs on the commercialization of Buddhism in the United States and tells a wonderful story about, uh, let's see, I can't even read my own writing. <laughs> he uh, echoes what others have said, and that is that Buddha's future in the United States uh, looks very, very good. Um, he offers stories from different areas of the country and different sanghas, a uh, Sanskrit word that means community, which refers to a group of Buddhists who come together and, and meditate together and, and take care of a, a Zen garden, for example, at a, at a Sangha, if, if the uh, community is lucky enough to have a garden. Uh, we have, uh, at the Nebraska Zen Center, we have a beautiful Zen garden, but unfortunately the Nebraska Zen Center has been shut down for like a year because of COVID, but anyway, um, he, Dinty Moore, offers stories from different areas of the country and different sanghas, from the Catskills to West Virginia. He tells the story of a couple in North Carolina that makes and sells zafus, or meditation cushions. His story about the third annual Change Your Mind Day a festival for meditators in Central Park and featuring various Buddhist luminaries, including the omnipresent and all things American Buddhism, Allen Ginsberg. Uh, it's a hysterical and, and, and touching uh, picture of, of what Buddha is in its infancy in the United States, which is, well, at the time, like I said, it was 1997. So it's been, it's, it's, caught on in the last few years quite quite admirably but anyway uh, uh he tells the story about meeting with a monk who runs a monastery in west virginia he quotes an excerpt from the monk's book that i think fully encapsulates why so many people and why so many americans gravitate towards meditation quote meditation is not easy it takes time and it takes energy it takes grit and determination and discipline. 
It requires a host of personal qualities that we normally regard as unpleasant and which we like to avoid whenever and wherever possible. So why bother? Why waste all that time and energy when you could be out enjoying yourself? Why? Simply because you are human. You find yourself heir to an inherent unsatisfactoriness in life which simply will not go away. You can suppress from your awareness for a time. You can distract yourself for hours on end, but it always comes back, usually when you least expect it. He goes on to quote him again in probably the most basic and descriptive way, uh, the reason why the author was drawn to Buddhism and the reason that I personally was drawn to Buddhism. Why do we meditate? Why Buddhism? <clears throat> Simply because you are human. You find yourself heir to this... Un I already read that part. I, I cut and pasted it. Ah. Are you a freak? No, you're just human, and you suffer from the same malady that affects every human being. We build a whole culture around hiding from it, pretending it's not there, and distracting ourselves from it with goals and projects and, and statues, but it never goes away. It is a constant undercurrent in every thought and every perception, a little wordless voice at the back of our head that keeps saying, not good enough. Gotta have more. Gotta make it better. Gotta be better. And that's it right there, isn't it? I mean, that's all of it. <laughs> so I've prattled on long enough, but suffice to say, I loved this book, uh, mostly because the author punctuated the fact that there is no magical moment where you get Buddhism, just like there is no there is no moment where you get life and reality and your place in all of it. Buddhism is fluid, like life, and reality are fluid. And the trick to getting it is to stop trying to get it. Because there really is no absolute it. No absolute reality. Except absolute reality. <laughs> There's no finish line. There's no final promotion. As Stephen King once said of the process of writing a novel, which, when you think about it, is not different than writing the story of your life in real time, the telling of the story is the journey. The point of the story is the journey. The story is the journey. The story is the point. So anyway, that is my review of The Accidental Buddhist by Dinty W. Moore. I hope you liked it. Uh, I sure did. And I am already through, uh, halfway through the third book that I'll be reviewing. And uh, the reason why I have uh, been so long in getting this review uh, out was because it was probably the last book I read before I decided I should be highlighting everything that I want to uh, to notate in these books. So I had to read the book again, which is great, which is fine, because I loved it. Um, so I, I hope you like it too, and I will hopefully be putting out a podcast sometime in the near future. I had an appointment, uh, I had a, a, an interview appointment for Saturday, but my job needs me, and so I'm probably not going to get another chance to interview anybody until, um, I don't know, like 10 days from now or two weeks from now, but who knows. Um, the point is, I put this one out, so I hope you like it. Thanks.